just right, it is episode number 109 of the School of Calisthenics podcast. And today we are talking about all things related to fatigue, recovery, and the perils of overtraining. There's no guest. It's just Jack and I delving into a little bit of knowledge and some research we've done to bring some fresh ideas to the table. And we hope this one is going to have a big impact on your training. Yeah, hopefully there's a lot of takeaways for you. But just before we get into the podcast, wanted to let you know because they're going out pretty fast is um, workshops for 2020 and retreats there is a ton of those on the website now we've got stuff in the UK we've got Ireland Scotland we've got Norway we're into Europe we've got um, a retreat in Sri Lanka and a retreat in the UK that's just been announced there is as it stands today at recording the UK retreat has only got three spaces left it's quite an intimate affair there's only eight total there's only three left and there is uh, five of the 12 spaces in Sri Lanka available as we record now. So it's two weeks ahead. So there may have been less when you log on, but go and check. If you are interested, come into a workshop, learning about and training with us um, or want to go on one of the retreats, go at schoolatcalisthenics.com. Check out the website, obviously, after you've listened to the, uh, the amazing podcast um, and look up workshops and or retreats. I think the phrase, Jacko, is hot potato. Hot, so hot cake. They're going like hot cakes. While aren't you mull which hot potato you want to kind of get a hold of. It's hot cakes, isn't it? Whichever. Cakes or potatoes. Whatever your preference. Sit back. Enjoy this podcast. Me and Jacko. Tell them what's next. On the School of Cast Next podcast. Roll the jingle. <laughs> So, Tim, uh, exciting day, um, not just because of what we're going to be talking about in terms of uh, overtraining, fatigue, and how to overcome those with uh, recovery strategies, but this is the first podcast we're doing live as part uh, for the VIP members of the virtual classroom. So, you may get interrupted, not just by me, but some questions coming in from the live listeners. Yeah, it's a new initiative, and it's safe to say that we don't exactly know how the engagement and interaction is going to work, but we are rolling with it i'm super excited when we get guests on people are actually going to be able to come on and ask their quiet questions direct to the esteemed professionals and experts that we have on our podcast and then they can also ask me and you if they want they probably yeah but they'll probably yeah they'll probably go for the the, the big cheese guests that we're going to get i would <laughs> if that was me so yeah that's for that's for the vip members in the virtual classroom so hello to all of you that are uh, listening um, and if you have questions, um, then put them in the chat box and uh, we'll be able to get to those uh, through the podcast. But so moving on to today's important subject. I'm one, excited about this one. Yeah, it's it's both it's important, both um, and ex- and you're excited about it because it's a topic that probably there's a lot of discussion around. We get asked questions about this all the time. It can be, it can be a lifesaver literally or, and or can make a huge difference to our training and something that everyone probably battles with to some degree. Um, and it is the concept of overtraining, what that is and what, what sort of fatigue is. And obviously you're going to delve into the depths of that. And then we're going to look at the recovery strategies and, um, so I guess review some of those, I guess. And, um, and give you uh, listeners at home as much take home advice um, for your recovery strategies to try and help you recover better and then ultimately like make more progress. And I just want to say at the start, just because we're going to talk about overtraining doesn't mean that these recovery strategies aren't going to be useful and helpful for everybody. You don't have to wait until you're absolutely maxed out and hitting all these markers of overtraining to decide to take some of these recovery strategies on board. Yeah, which is exactly the point, isn't it? We'll dive into that as we go through. I think let's just um probably need to put a little bit of context around Set it. The scene. Because this could be one of the most significant parts of uh, additions or tweaks to to your training program if you're training to a certain level and consistency and frequency. Um if you are sort of like only sort of that dabbing in and out of training once a week or every now and again, then it's probably not going to be such a big issue. But as the training scales, these are really important things to take on board. Now, there's, there's just a couple of things, Jacko, and I want you to get your, just your thoughts on this one. Oh, yes. When it comes to overtraining, there is a little bit of confusion around the internet. I, I'm going to quote C.T. Fletcher because I think it was him <laughs> who says that it doesn't exist. 
So if you ever see any of that sort of like rhetoric around, there is no such thing as overtraining. It's not true. I've met people and seen people in sport who have hit overtraining and it's not a good place to be. And we'll talk about that in a bit more detail. I'm sure there's some scientific literature yeah. on and people defining, not only testing, but also defining what that yeah. is. The, the context that I'm, I think C.T. Fletcher is referring to is that most people don't actually train hard enough yeah. is the biggest thing. But we know that from the people that have engaged with us, the questions we get around this, then, yeah, there are people that are starting to kind of verge on that level. But the reality is overtraining is a fairly difficult thing for most people to hit who are non-professional athletes because at some point or another, something gets in the way, which means we've taken a forced rest, which could be injury, unfortunately, for some people. And that could be one of the signs of kind of pushing a bit too hard. But it also could be just like a holiday or work travel or family life or something like that. And Mike Boyle, who's a strength and conditioning coach with an incredible amount of experience, a guy that I've followed throughout my career and I've got a lot of love respect for, it doesn't necessarily worry too much about deload weeks. This idea of taking scheduled gaps within a training program or within a block of training, because he says often athletes will get that anyway. They've got a dentist appointment or they've got a media appointment or something like that, which means that they miss some level of training. But this idea of what we're, we're essentially reaching into is going, we're going to train, we're going to create a level of fatigue as a result of training, which is an important byproduct because that stress and fatigue is going to be the, what causes an adaptation down the line. If we continue to create lots of stress and lots of fatigue, we get into a point where recovery becomes really important. And if we go too far down that rabbit hole, we can get into this realm of what is known as overtraining. And just to give a bit of definition on that one, I pulled this out of the essentials of strength and conditioning, David, to give yeah. a little bit of a academic flavor flavor that's the right word so excessive frequency volume or intensity of training that results in extreme fatigue illness or injury and often due to lack of sufficient rest recovery and perhaps nutrient intake that's a definition of, of overtraining and from what i've seen and known from athletes and spoken to them in the past that can be six months 12 months it can actually sometimes even be career ending because it is a really significant and serious um, issue where people don't sleep they don't want to eat they can't train they've got no energy a lot of things like the wheels properly fall off yeah there's just to jump in then on just something specific to probably calisthenics and the people that are listening that the um sort of the the notion you made about ct fletcher saying there is none and and saying that actually it can be quite difficult to actually get into that fully over trained uh area but with the fact that those of us that are engaged in calisthenics and love it, the the things like the rate of progression and the enjoyment um, and the sort of ad addictive nature of learning to do some of these cool new things, one can make it, I believe, us more susceptible to that because we don't want to have a break and rest because we still want to go and do that thing that we're striving to do. Um, and then on top of that, the things that when we're trying to redefine our impossible, some of those things are super maximal, like they are more than we can currently do um you're less you can still overtrain when you're doing bench press but chances are if you can't lift 100 kilos on the bench press you don't put 110 on and just keep having a crack at it whereas if you can't you know take two legs off on a frog stand for example there's there's times when you have to try and test that can i now take two off or not and mm. we're train some of that intensity is above what we're at and that can make things susceptible yeah. to it a little bit that's where i just think there's a little bit of a flight there's a little bit of something in um calisthenics that means that the whole reason why we're doing this podcast is to to put some markers in place to go okay what what do i need to look out for for if i'm potentially overtraining or getting towards that area um and then what are we gonna what we're we gonna do to maximize our recovery so yeah. one, it doesn't happen. Two, we actually progress better and faster. Yeah, I think the the the, the important point as well with overtraining is that it's, it's total physiological system-wide shutdown. It's not localized, which is what we're often going to find in calisthenics where we're doing a lot of load and intensity through the same joints. So overtraining isn't having a shoulder problem 
or an elbow issue, that's an injury or a niggle. Overtraining is, is, is much more serious. So we ultimately want to avoid that. And this is where we're going to start to kind of, we want to wind back, but that's our end goal. We don't want, well, not end goal. That's the end point. We don't, we want to avoid at all costs. So bringing that back a little bit, just to define some of the terminology, the step before overtraining is what we have is overreaching, which is actually a positive place to be. And often we'll schedule for athletes in our own training, scheduled periods of overreaching where you're pushing the limits pretty hard because we want to then go and get adaptation. Now, where I think a lot of people fall down on is the overreach for too long. When we overreach with a, with a periodized plan, the, f- the focus is then to apply stress for a s- determined period of time followed by a scheduled rest period. We know we're going to hit that rest period. If that's pre-competition, we might be loading for the, for the month, month or say six weeks out from a competition and then two weeks or 10 days before we drop the intensity or the volume down at least the intensity may stay still quite high but we're not asking the athlete to do as much and therefore the system gets a chance to recover we get the super compensation we're looking for as a result of this the response to the stress that's the adaptation that we need so we get super compensation if we hit that right it's in time for the competition the guys go out and they fly for us in calisthenics as recreational athletes we'll often find ourselves overreaching because we're training consistently week in, week out. We're chasing these goals. We're super excited about it. We're training hard. Give yourself a pat on the back. And all of a sudden, like you start to kind of feel like it's actually, I'm not feeling that good. I think that's one of, I think that's one of the biggest difficulties of um, being an amateur recreational fitness enthusiast, whatever you want to call yourself, that you don't have that competition where you are going to definitely plan to peak and rest and therefore rest for it. And also somebody telling you, this is your volume for this week. Yeah. It's a scheduled rest week and you do what you're told. Yeah. Effectively. Yeah. I mean, you can do whatever you like every week. Yeah. I'm trying not to bore people with like old rugby stories, but like this, I've done, I've got the contrast of both like doing a weekly thing where literally most weeks when I was playing pro rugby, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday felt pretty crap. But then Thursday, Friday and if we played Sunday Saturday would be like super easy days and you'd feel great for the game and then you'd feel crap again at the start of the week whereas now I don't have anything to rest for effectively like Mm. I'm with people in there going like this is difficult when you don't have that thing to try and peak for Um, and so that's um, first first step for me is just like being aware of that um, so that so that you know that that's what's happening yeah Um, and that and then, you know, then we can start, once we have the awareness, then we can start thinking about how to, um, how to, to put the strategies in place to, to keep on top of it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think we're, as recreational athletes, we, we train at the level of intensity that we do because we enjoy it and it makes us feel good. But there's also that psychological side of, of training addiction, I think, which is a, an, an interesting one of people training and feeling like if they don't train, they're going to get themselves into... Uh, they're going to lose all the gains. They just they don't they they lose that sort of um, the the hormonal or the the, the sort of like the, the um, which which hormone am I thinking of the uh, dopamine hits and the serotonin of the benefits of of exercise. And we don't get that. We start to feel bad. We look at ourselves differently in the mirror. We get this kind of that negative downward spiral as a result of not training, and and that means that we just continue to train. Where the important thing about that is that we actually understand that rest weeks or deload weeks are not steps backwards. They're actually steps forwards. And we have to go through that process of psychologically dealing with not training. And then one of the things you can do that before we get into a little bit around recovery strategies and how we can manage fatigue is if we're going to try and prep an athlete or even even in our own training and we're going to use this deload week. So we might have gone a three-week load. That's how the virtual classroom programs are set up. It's three weeks of intensity followed by a scheduled one week deload where we drop the volume down, but intensity stays high. So on the week three, or if we work it through, maybe we've gone week one, it could be 12 reps and two sets for argument's sake. Week two will be 10 reps and three sets. Week three, eight reps and four sets. What we might do on week number four as a deload is just go 10 reps, one set but that 10 reps needs to be at, at intensity. And research has shown that we can maintain strength levels for about 20 weeks or so if we keep the intensity. 
effectively, it makes sense. If you tell your brain or central nervous system that you need to perform intensity at this level, it's going to keep that motor yeah. ability. It's not going to drop it back. If we go and train under that level, it's going to think, well, do you know what? No point being this that strong because I don't really need all of that strength. So we maybe can just shed a little bit of this. So by maintaining intensity, we can get through a deload week without losing anything, but we're creating space to recover because the volume isn't as high. We're not asking the system to do as much work. And as a result, we get the recovery. Yeah, 100%. Um, do, can, do we want to just, uh, if people are asking the question, okay, I'm, I'm smashing myself fairly regularly with my training. I train four, five, six, I have X number of times a week. What are some of the markers then that we that they need to be looking out for in terms of am I am I potentially overtraining or you know am I taking my overreaching a bit too far? Yeah, I think people will probably know when they get to the overtraining stage. That's the, the positive thing to think about. That if you really like things are going to go wrong at that stage, overreaching is probably more difficult to start to be aware of. And it is that self awareness of taking a step back and actually knowing how do I feel. Like every time I go in the gym, and you you said in the past, I don't want to pat myself on the back, but you've said to me, yeah, I do this quite well. Yeah. Tim, Tim is very good at this. Oh, so I'm learning from fishing, him. Fishing from for a compliment. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> but I'll go in the whole time and I'll, I'll, I'll go in about how do I feel today or how do I feel when I wake up? And if I'm buzzing to train, I'm going to go like, and I'll push it because I know there's going to be times when I go in and I might do the first set. An example of the other day, my training hasn't kicked off well this year, but I didn't start well. It's getting better. I did one set of handstand push-ups against the wall, which would have normally been easy, and it felt shocking. And I was like, I'm not doing it anymore. Just binned it. Yeah. Rather than sort of chasing that and thinking, oh, I've got to do those today because it's on the program, yeah. I just went and did something else. So understanding where you're at on any given day is, is super important, and having the flexibility within your training program to go, I don't have to train today. I think that's, a, that's having the flexibility in your mind to give yourself the permission to do that. That's where I've slowly 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 trying to get to that place and i've have made some progress on that i do believe and do think but i'm a stick stiffler and i'm sure other people are for literally going i said i'm gonna do x number of reps and sets of this thing and then even if it feels shocking you feel guilty if you're not gonna do them because that's what you planned yeah and that's what's on the program and actually it the freedom comes from in your mind allowing yourself to have that i think that's that is a as a mindset thing, that is a um, yeah a, a trust in what you're doing on the on the macro in the big scale, yeah. rather than just in the micro going or not all of a sudden going oh I can't do a muscle up anymore or I can't do a frog stand anymore. Yeah. You know, we have we've had people have those types of uh, conversations, and it's actually no, no it's just the re the reason why they felt shocking could be any number of things so that you can work it out. But ultimately, it doesn't matter that much. What matters is what you then actually go and mm -hmm. do and train. Um, and you can only, it's just a one thought of thing, you can only, there's only, there's, there's no need to do there's, as much, trying to get my words right on this. Trying to, what I'm trying to say is like, there's no point in doing any more work than you can recover from. Yeah. If you can't recover from it, then it's only going to be detrimental, yeah. even if you try and do it. But again, there's lots of, lots of people out there, and I've been there myself before, where depending on what sort of training environment you've been in before, like slugging it out and gritting your teeth and do it. like I got asked to do that for many years in a row mm. where it's then different when it gets trained into you. Like say if someone's been in the army, which would be way and other sort of forces things will be way beyond trying to do rugby. I can imagine like the mindset you get put in for that then is going to be going to stay with you for quite some time when you come out. And yeah. so things like that, do you know what I mean? Like we did arm, we did like pre-season and army camps and whatnot. And they're like, we used a phrase <laughs> when I first met you, which was like, more is more. And I'd never heard that before. And I was like, I know exactly what you mean by we just more used is to more. Say, it was like, we, yeah, we would joke about it. Like when we, so, cause at times you'd literally go like, Oh, we, we weren't too bad. We'd hear stories of other teams where they go like, they lost Saturday, Sunday's rest day. Mm. And then they go, I oh, know, actually, you're coming in now and doing fitness like, yeah. hard because you, we you weren't very fit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That'll help. <laughs> and it's like, I'm just because you know that I wasn't very fit because I was maxed out for the last <laughs> 80 minutes. So, what was really good is you just maxed me out again without yeah. giving me recovery from what I've just done. Monday's going to go down real well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we, we've often talked in sports before around like, you want to do the least amount of work to get the most amount of change. And often it's that, um, can we, um, 
it's not the amount of work you can do. It's the amount of work that you can recover from. And, and that's what's going to create a sort of long-term change. That's what I, would, that's <laughs> what I was trying to say. It really struggles to get there. Swimmers are a nightmare for that. We've done a lot of work in swimming. And um, you often find that a coach, a swimming coach, will write a set and they want to hit a certain amount of volume, for example. So they might have finished their set on the board and they've written down how many lengths of, and distances and strokes and whatever else they're going to do. And the total might have come in at, say, 4, 000, say 5,600 meters. They won't just go, oh, that's the amount of work we need to do. They'll make, we'll do 400 easy or 400 of something else to make it 6,000 because I've got to hit this total volume by the end of the week. And I look at it and go, why are you doing that? It's just it, the phrase that they use in swimming is garbage yardage. Like you're just doing it for the sake of doing it, not because it's actually creating an adaptation. Um, so that we've been a little bit off tack there, yeah. but the, the point of that it being that y- we want to make sure that we are efficient with the training and what we're doing and training when we feel like we want to train. So go back to your point, Jack, cause I know you've got a couple yeah, of things. Like, like, so like yeah, some on, things yeah. that like, so if you are uh, classic ones, if you're overtraining, if you're starting to your appetite, you start to lose your appetite. You find that your sleep is disrupted. You're waking up in the middle of the night. Or you find it difficult to go to sleep and you normally sleep well, that can be a bit of a marker. Um, you know what the biggest one for me is? Don't want to train. Yeah. But well, you like, force yourself into it. Do you remember what Joe, my old S&C coach, we had him on the podcast. You can, people can check. I can't remember what number it was. It wasn't that. It was only probably a couple months ago. Yeah. Where he said, he gave that exact advice. If you don't want to go and train and you are a serial overtrainer, don't make yourself. Mm. Um, it's different advice if you are you are only just getting started getting into fitness you don't you're scared of going to the gym trail or as you've got these things you only really often train once a week mm. sometimes you don't at all like that's a different that's a different conversation um and then a, a really really big one is if you are training hard doing a lot of work you're on point you're following your program you probably you might be following a program in the virtual class so you might not you might yeah that'd be fine because they've got a deload week scheduled for them <laughs> yeah but they, yeah but they might find it hard to do that deload True. week and if you find that you are no longer making progress i go in the gym and i feel weaker and everything feels harder you're not recovering as well then it's then it, it almost must be that you are not giving yourself that chance to recover and that you're going down the route of overtraining so i think there might from there would be the most obvious ones to look out for i'd say yeah, definitely i think that that sort of appetite to train is a big one um stress and the other one for me the big one is niggles if you start to feel like your body's breaking down and you just your shoulders a little bit niggly or you just not that's a sign that you're not recovering elbows start flaring up particularly in calisthenics those niggles are early signs of a system not recovering or there's some form of postural imbalance that's going on. So again, it's looking about what work have I done previously? Is it just work has actually been quite balanced? The training program has been good, but I'm starting to feel like I can't keep up with this. Maximal strength training is a, is a massive one for this for me. Yeah. If you're doing heavy reps and you're doing high intensity work and you are starting to feel like you're neurally just not firing when you get in the gym and the joints are starting to feel sore you 100 percent need to take some deload and recovery or, or the deload or what we're going to go into next is how do you promote faster recovery between sessions because if you, if you continue to just drill that that pattern that you're doing take pull-ups as an example and you're not recovering body's breaking down that niggle will become an injury at some point and it will sideline you and your body will get your recovery it's just going to force it upon yeah. you like your body's not stupid it knows it can't continue to do that for a while so the brain will just stop you from training that's effectively what overtraining is the central nervous system going i'm not doing this anymore guys like pack up we're having a hard day <laughs> <laughs> and you're left to pick up the pieces so then final thing i wanted to mention before because this is we've all talked purely based on training and the physical training you do is just going to be one of the stresses you're Great putting point. on your body. I'm, I'm making this because Catherine said, my wife said this to yeah, me. This, very good she point. gave this to me this morning. Take it as your own. You need it was to. Like, <laughs> no, <laughs> give her a shout. Mrs. She won't listen. Um, yeah, she won't. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, she should do because we prove that I'm listening to her. Right, she yeah. says I'm not listening. Um, that, yeah, so your physical training that we do in the gym or how, wherever you do it, that's just one of the stresses. You've got a ton of other stresses on the body that the body's going to deal with. So we have to look at the full picture um, of what's going on in your life and take all that into consideration. Not just if my training, I don't feel like I'm overtraining with my training, but when I go in the gym, I feel crap. And 
you know, I've just had a baby and I'm only getting four hours broken sleep or what, yeah. what else is going on Might in your life? Might get maybe redundant or anything yeah, like, like that. You get yeah. Mental stress, emotional stress. There's so many different things um, that go into this. And then actually when you think of it like that, you go, oh, cranky, the training stress is like, I feel like that's quite a big one I put on myself. But it is only just one factor. And then it's something that I'm trying to do having, you know, we've had some great guests on recently that are very much more uh, holistic, like Tony Riddle, Sally Bell, um, Richie Norton, where what other things in my life um, can I look at and improve the recovery of those things? Um, and, and, and trying to just throw that into, into the mix. And just wanted to flag that up there because everything else we're probably going to talk about here on in is going to be very much training based and recovering yeah. from training. That's an interesting point because a lot of what we are going to talk about will come from the sports science literature of what do we do in an elite performance environment to, to speed recovery. And it's probably going to, it will come at some point, but breath work isn't going to feature on that list of what a lot of people are doing. Um, apart from the guy we saw Jeremy Shepard speak at the UKSCA and he trained at the time, I think he's still there, was working with this uh, Canadian snowboarding team. Um, and they were training the gym and then he said, we just go and lay out in the grass and we, we breathe and we meditate and we dig it. <laughs> it's like, that sounds amazing. But these sorts of things of actually the wellness around your just general health and well-being is way more important than whether you go home and put your compression tights on. Um, put into context so breath work again and when, I, and when i finish my breath work I come to reason the oxygen advantage and it is amazing <laughs> but i'm only about a quarter of way through um so i will have some more views on that um yeah jacko won't be able to talk on a podcast for long because he'll be have his mouth taped with duct tape. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <so> you <laughs> i mean that's a conversation before we started yeah <laughs> Mrs. <laughs> Mrs. Jacko asks, is it, I take it to him, they ask a few funny questions, or you certainly raise some eyebrows when you rock up <laughs> into the bedroom with a roll of gaffer tape. <laughs> but oh, different, that's for another <laughs> podcast oh, go from together. There. Right, anyway. Right. So, um, if that's really <laughs> weird, freaked you out, don't freak out. If you just read Oxygen Advantage book and you'll learn that a little bit more. <laughs> So when we let's talk about these potential recovery strategies, then the, the yes. ones that, that sports science will will, will as well research and the things that we've used with athletes in the past, and it's worth just thinking about. There's a hierarchy of yeah. these. There's well, not, can I just say there that? Are I many. Think people often, and so I've just put it in, but like we often get asked and we give out most of our uh, advice information is like, how do I make my training better? Like very rarely, and well, we do have got the questions, but the, this is more about, okay, what about making your training better? But if you make your training better, you also have to make your recovery better because mm. you're potentially going to be like doing more work or better quality or whatever. And we don't probably go, how can I maximize my recovery? It's very natural to think, how do I maximize my training? Yeah. Um, so I got really excited right. about that. No, no, it's fine. So <laughs> we'll have, um, so we will typically kind of categorize these and we'll sort of say it like there are some level one things and level one being the first level, call it gold standard or, or your basic essentials a. that are going to give us, yeah, the best sort of return on your investment. And there are some quite sort of sexy sort of gimmicky stuff a little bit down the line. Gimmicky is, is like a, the, the duct tape. Yeah, yeah, we'll come to that again later. Um, that, that might look more attractive and like look easy, but actually it's the simple things done well which are going to have the biggest impact. So remember that the human body and the system is fairly primitive in many of its, uh, in much of its design in the sense of it really likes sleep. So if the body is tired and it's stressed from, from wherever that, the source of that stress comes from, one of the number one things that you can do to make sure that you are given the best chance of recovery is get a decent night's sleep. Um, we were actually in the level two, we're actually going to put napping into that as well. But if you've nailed down a decent amount of sleep um, and it's decent, it's good quality, it's restful, that's when so much of the regenerative processes take place while we are sleeping. That's your first like, sort of number one sort of gold standard thing you can, you can have a look at. The other ones we're going to start to think about are going to be nutrition. So what are we fueling? If we're doing sessions and they are intense and the body is going to need the right nutrients to be able to um, to actually replenish the stores and to, to repair and, and to grow, whatever that might be. And that's not a referral towards a supplementation. That is just all well, well-rounded, basic day-to-day -day nutrition. We're not talking about how much protein you're taking in necessarily, what supplement or which powders you're going to use. Is it creatine? Is it beta-aniline? Whatever. We're talking about just eat well, just basics of get plenty of fruit and veg in, 
decent amount of protein sources, wherever that comes from, carbohydrates from a good source to, to make sure you, you've refilling glycogen stores, etc. Real simple as a nutrition. Yeah, and, and just remember one of those markers of overtraining might be loss of appetite. And then therefore you're in then a bit of a cycle of you might not be eating then enough calories and enough food to actually help when so that that's that can, those two things are going to work against you so making sure that you're aware of those and you've planned and got that in place um to make sure that you are staying on top of them just going back to the sleep mm. that's what i was just searching for because I, <laughs> I like it when we if i like listen to other people's podcasts you know and they can like tell you the actual yeah what so i was trying to interactive um Episode 92 with Nick Littlehales, sleep expert. If you want to know a little bit more about sleep and how to maximize it, et cetera, et cetera, including uh, naps and everything, fantastic podcast and advice in that one. So that's episode 92. Check that one out if you haven't yet. Um, the next one I was just going to touch on with that is around, we've talked like rest and sleep is going to come sort of together, but um, rest from training, as we've touched on already, you've probably got the point across that we think that scheduled breaks you know, or gaps, deload weeks, lower intensity or lower volume weeks within training programs are of value. So making sure that we are taking time to allow the body to recover by giving it a scheduled deload. And one of the other ones that fits in, and this is on, comes on two fronts, is around mobility work. Mobility work is really good for restoring the system. Now, there's two things, and Jack and I have challenged ourselves on this in the past before. We don't do a great job of it all the time, often because how we're all kind of training. We will finish a session, done loads of super high intensity stuff, put a ton of intensity through the through the connective tissue and through the joints, and then the session is finished. And I walk out the door. How much value would there be to my recovery if I actually spent five to 10 minutes just down regulating the system? I've just ramped it up and put a ton of stimulation through it, actually just spending some time coming back down. So typically, and back in the olden days, we would have called that a cool down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we don't exactly. do it anymore. Like it's one of the things where we just kind of we just ditch it off in, in, in gym environments. So a little bit of work of maybe some active recovery, just flush the system just gently, or it might be that we are going to go and do some stretching, some mobility work, some release work, mobilization. We some of our breath work then as well that will exactly. help to down regulate the central nervous exactly. system too. So, and that yeah. sounds really fluffy. It's the sort of stuff like, oh, crack, I've got, I've got to be somewhere, I've got to go five to ten minutes uh, just to prompt that recovery and if you can't do it straight after the session we can probably find times throughout the rest of the next day or later on that day or whatever it might be a walk a gentle jog we used to do a recovery session when i was working in university on a thursday the guys would play wednesday afternoon for the rugby team they would come in on a thursday we would roll out stretch out mobilize and then we'd go and chuck them on a bike or something just yeah. to do low ticking over 60 percent max heart rate yeah. and just do 20 minutes just to flush the legs out, we would do that moving. we would do that after every game yeah flush the legs 20 minutes half an hour they like say 60 percent like nice and easy and yeah. just um yeah flush the system out um, I find that helps for me just going for a gentle jog sometimes yeah. just, or swim. Yeah, you don't or always something. have to kill yourself. Do you? yeah. um, and on uh, just on that, um, it, in terms of going like, would five or 10 minutes be well spent just stretching or down regulating, basically doing a, a cool down. And if you're asking yourself the question, oh, I don't know if I can fit that in. When you're at the end of your session doing the final exercise or the last set or two sets, Ask yourself, and you, and if you're asking yourself the question, "Am I overtraining a bit too much? I feel pretty smashed." But then go, "But I ain't got time to do that." Mm. That, well, maybe swapping your final couple of sets or final exercise for that might not be a bad thing. And at least test it out. Do it for a few weeks. Do you start to feel a little bit better? Like we're trying to give help and advice for those that are seeking that extra little yeah. bit of like, and that's maybe one thing of it's what we're going to prioritize. If you if you don't prioritize your recovery, you're never going to be great at recovery. Yeah. So Simplize. on those sort of level one options, um, it's pretty basic. As I said, sleep, nutrition, getting rest or, or scheduled recovery and investing in mobilization. A lot of the stuff that we do in calisthenics can be quite high tension, particularly in all sports the same, but just going back to mobility and spending some time deregulating the system in whatever format that might look like for you but actually bringing the system back down to a resting state rather than ramping it up and just going, see you later, I'm done. We're going to have to go and get some more stress now because I'm going back to work or, yeah. or whatever it might yeah, be. Yeah, yeah. I think what you, the point you've made before about um, planning scheduled like deload weeks, all of those things you just said there, 
all require or all going to require you to or um actually plan those things out so actually just be a little bit more conscious a little bit more aware and plan out some of those things that are as you say level one basic simple there's not really any excuses everyone can do those you just have to want to do them and, and, yeah. and a little bit of a, a plan in place to make sure they happen and with those things going to tick that off if you get a decent night's sleep like sort of averaging eight hours eight hours a night consistently not just one night but consistently over a period of weeks and we've got scheduled deloads and we're investing some time and some mobility and we're eating well right okay if i've got if i've got athletes that are doing those things well happy days like we can start to look at level two kind of progressions are you ready for a share go on uh, last three nights woke up at 3 30 a.m 4 a.m and 4 30 a.m couldn't really get back to sleep till i don't know when like it got a tiny bit of sleep before alarm goes off at six and i'm like immediately going now quick going so I have been going, right, why is that happening? Where, where am I at on some of these right? I mean, I'm still eating well at the moment. Training feels pretty decent, but there's something amiss here. Um, and what is it to do with the over, is it the stressor of the physical training or are there some other things that are, I'm, I'm stressing out about? But immediately when that starts to happen, it's like, right, what, what am I going to do to try and fix this? Because that's not right. Um, I've had the same thing. I was Steve, we were I was away for quite a lot of um December and I start I wasn't sleeping well. I was sleeping terribly before we went because we we're trying to get everything done before we went. I was, wasn't I had a really bad night's sleep. Started to sleep really well when I was on holiday. First night or first day, night after we got back in to start thinking about work, I wake up in the middle of the night, <laughs> go is. to the toilet, come back, and my mind's like on. Let's think about all this stuff to him. And it's happening now. So I've got to do yeah, something yeah. as well to try and just get myself to a point where I'm sleeping better. But I'm quite a light sleeper. So it doesn't take a lot to wake me up. And then when I'm awake, I'm like, brain just wants to go. But that's the first one. Can we protect that time? Well, screens before bed, that will come up in Nick L- 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 yes. L- Little Hills. But that's yeah. an obvious one for people. But one that this day and age, we're all guilty of. Yeah. So get your screens off. Right, level two things. We get to the yes. more the sort of the sexier sort of the bits where the sports marketing comes in and tells us all these things that we need. <laughs> um, so compression is one of the things we're getting compression tights on. Are they good for recovery? Um, if you're interested, you can go and read some of the research around that. The original compression tight concept came from bedridden patients who couldn't move about. If you are moving about, then your calf pump, if you are an ambulant person, is going to be doing a large amount of the work of starting to get the blood that is pooling in the legs, which is full of waste products and lactic acid, that kind of thing, back moving around the system. So that's where the, the active recovery comes in, just moving blood around the system more like um, to improve that sort of that clear out and just to get, stop that pooling. If the compression has got some merit, if the compression garment creates enough compression, you need actually quite high values. The, um, the original medical grade ones were like, I know I could feel your legs, but the ones we get now often are not necessarily tight enough. So you need a good pair of compression tights. And typically, like if we're going to get the guys, if we're going to travel with, with the athletes on, on teams, if we're doing long haul flights, we have compression garments on. We might have compression socks. If you've done heavy sessions, we might be used, we might be sleeping in them. But it's those periods of time where we have got eight, 10, 12 hours of compression where we're not really been moving yeah. around that much. That's when we want to be starting to worry about it. I wear compression tights quite a lot because I like how they feel. There's a perceptual thing which we're going to come on to yeah. later yeah. on. But that's the science behind a compression. It's not guaranteed, they're not magic. There are certain circumstances where they have a little bit more impact. Yeah. I've got a, a tight upper body one. Uh, I, I like to uh, ensure that it's so tight that it is a struggle to get off. That's yeah, a marker of me. Have a good, I almost just a struggle to get mine off. <laughs> um, Don't do that. <laughs> The other one is going to be soft tissue. Like that's pretty good. We've used that before in a passive, actually getting, getting some release work, doing hands-on therapy. That's not available to everybody all the time. So go back to point one around just investing your own you know, mobility and, and that yeah. kind of thing. Um, sleep, I'll go back to naps, taking power naps throughout the day, 25 minutes, 45 minutes maximum, hitting those, those cycles, especially if you're not sleeping well at night. If you've got athletes like in swimming, if they wake up early, they're in the gym, you could be doing the same thing. Six o'clock sessions, you get into bed at 10, you're struggling to get that eight hours in. You can go and top some of that up a little bit by putting a sleep cycle in later on in the day if you can. Again, it depends on what your work is like. And again, going back to Jacko's point, Nick offers some good suggestions around how we can 
build those kind of like nap periods into our I think he'd ideally everyone would have a bed at work as well wouldn't they oh, I, don't know, I don't know that everybody will be able to do that yeah. So those are some of the, the like the level two areas where we start to think about it and, and specific nutrition as well. And that might come down to what sort of training we're doing. If we're doing a hypertrophy block of building muscle mass, we're going to prompt and improve recovery by taking a nutritional approach, which is more specific um, for that type of training, or if it's an endurance type adaptation. In calisthenics, I don't think we desperately need to do a huge amount of that unless you are training for something else. If you're getting a basic sort of a solid diet in around your day-to-day nutrition and you are getting your protein requirements in, you hit your carbohydrate basics. Do we need to start worrying about specific strategies? Maybe if you're trying to put some muscle mass on, but if you're also training for a marathon at the same time, then that becomes a bit more individualized perhaps. Yeah. And I think a lot of people listening are often like us. They do other things. They like running or cycling, OCRs or whatever it may be. Um, but ultimately, like what's all that? We might have certain goals that we've got as well. But ultimately, what's what's our training in our life about? We've talked a lot in the past about, um, and and probably think think about it more and more and more every single day, week, month, year. We get older. Of like, it's we need to have an eye on. There should be some element of like I want to be able to use my body mm. when I'm older, and I want to be hit, fit, healthy, and well, and enjoy life for for the rest of rest of my life. So like what would be the impact of me at 45 years old going hell for leather at some marathon goal i yeah. don't know i'm just posing that sort of question if you know what i mean so if we if we work if we work a bit more generalist we we'll probably get less obsessive about things yeah. as well if you've got that yeah. type of personality and then i'm going to come back to ice bat in a minute Ooh. which might have fallen into category two but we'll just, I want to, because it links into the perception. Exactly. Oh, I don't know if it was in the magic box. <laughs> yeah, this is the thing we should be doing. And um, the level three that we often use with athletes is, is targeted supplementation. It could be, for example, that we are, I don't know, recovery based supplements. I don't know, off my head. But a lot of the supplements that we'll use are going to be performance based. There are times where athletes have had collagen supplementation before, they've got as a cerebral palsy blah, blah, blah. there's a number of different specific things but for most people yeah, and they're following they're being prescribed by the nutritional therapist exactly. or sports yeah, medicine exactly. person at a professional outfit That's, yeah. yeah so there's different things that you can do within that the other ones that we use are something called a normatec which is a high-end sort of compression based um, device if you want to call it that it's big leg sleeves you put your leg in it and it just ramps up compression it goes more like to what the original um medical grade compression yeah. garments were like but it flushes have you ever tried i've never tried them. yeah they're good them? yeah they are they feel nice you sit how there much are they? lots how much is lots oh, i don't know thousands but i'm not gonna have one at home yeah let's see but i don't know i don't actually know you know it's like it's, it's just you don't buy anything yeah, yeah. <laughs> so i was just wondering if you just uh... someone just appears with a new gadget and goes you want to play this i'm like yes we strap <laughs> it on <laughs> i'll have a go what is it i don't know have a go is it to do training <laughs> yeah but it may be bigger um <laughs> so you, I mean, there's an upper and lower body version ones you plug yourself in it whirs away you sit there and it flushes some blood out of your legs effectively but they're pretty effective there's also something called game ready which includes a bit of like cold water therapy within that and then we also have something called fireflies or geckos which are sort of a little like magnet electric magnetic stimulant for the calf which again just keeps that calf pump working to stop blood from pooling and sometimes the guys use those on flights is yeah. essentially what it is but it gets all sexy and sports performance but if you're not doing level one if you're only getting five hours of sleep yeah. a night you put a, a firefly on is it absolutely like you're just pissing me in the wind yeah. and you know the vast majority of us the majority of us haven't got access to that and we can't afford it no. anyway but like you say actually how many people i would actually question how many of the people using them are actually taking care of those basics like yeah. properly taking care of those bases because it takes real discipline yeah um, yeah, and they're that's where the, the hardest wins are. The biggest wins are in the bases, though, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, just I'm, I'm going to touch on ice baths because it might be one that people are talking about. The research in, in in recent years has come out about this is actually starting to sort of tell a different story. There was a time when it was a gold standard. Get an ice bath that'll sort you right out. But what they're starting to do now is delve a little bit deeper, and they're sort of saying, well, in this situation, an ice bath could actually be detrimental to performance. In this situation, it could be quite useful. So in competition environments, we've got fast turnaround. Potentially, it's got some benefits. We start talking about things like, 
it, depending on how the ice bath is done, if it's a deep plunge pool, we might, we might get a level of compression. There's an analgesic effect of taking pain away, so the athlete doesn't feel quite as sore. We might decrease some inflammation, get muscle temperature down, these kind of things. However, if you're trying to build muscle, what happens from a hormone perspective of um, or the, the physiological response from an ice bath might not actually be beneficial for, for hypertrophy. So the, the, the jury is out as it is on a lot of this sort of stuff. Yeah. And that's why we go back to level one basics of the jury is not out on sleep. It's yeah. not out on nutrition. So those are the things that we know are going to have an impact. The rest of this sort of stuff, depending on which paper you read, you're going to find some yeah. fairly conflicting um, results. With the, with the ice bath or the cold stuff, you've also mixed in with that is something that we have done in when we when i was playing what we did in the past was some some hot cold therapy so yeah. transitioning from one to the other two three minutes of each to help with that sort of flushing system and um, to get rid of some uh, some of the toxins etc um and that's like cold water therapy has become very popular in recent years but we're not talking about that's a different context is it going to is it going to improve general well-being is a different conversation as to immediately post performance. Yeah. yeah. Um, different. They overlap to a certain degree. You know yeah. what I'm saying? It's yeah, like yeah. Going for a dip in the water in a, in a cold lake daily is a different utilization of us stressing ourselves in the gym yeah. and then going and getting in a nice bath yeah. for the purposes of. And here's something I've just thought of actually going like, say I've done, um, I've done my session. My recovery strategy is I'm jumping in the ice bath. I've got an ice bath set up, whatever. I've got a bin at home or however you do it. I, I jump in that. I tick the box for myself that goes, did my recovery. And then that actually makes me think I'm doing a good job of it. And then I slack off on my sleep, other stresses, emotional things going on in my life and slack off on my nutrition. And then actually, do you see what I'm yeah, trying yeah. to say? That you actually how it, you kill yourself. Yeah, you might, because you're ticking a box of this yeah. other thing. Um, but saying with saying that, um, the I at the weekends in Whitby, and you know whenever I'm at the sea, you I go in the sea. Time. I've left a pair of pants in Whitby. <laughs> um, was that a diff, was that was that, <laughs> was that related to the sea yeah, so, to the swim or not? Different story. <laughs> right, just no, check it. No, so, I've done that with Jack before recently. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just tripped them away. It's not worth the effort. <laughs> um, and it was freezing. Um, it was well, not as in it wasn't frozen, but it was pretty cold. Um, but and I, when I come, out, I love the feeling when I come out, um, and I feel better for it. And I thought I'd just use that as an as a, a segue into mm. something that you'd mentioned before. We've done a, a presentation to athletes on this subject before, where the overriding factor. I remember you saying at the end of of the presentation to these athletes was, what when if something works for you even if it's a placebo a placebo is a comment my dad normally four percent four percent my dad loves a placebo have i told you about the placebo david <laughs> you give someone creatine and it's as a placebo or give them what they think is creatine yeah. the research will suggest you have four to five percent improvement when it's just flipping bicarbonate or yeah. whatever yeah example, if it's just yeah. white powder yeah <laughs> <laughs> <Bad> <laughs> <job>. <laughs> but basically if if i but if if me jumping in some cold water makes me feel better and i'm feeling like i'm recovering even if it is placebo i will take that yeah um and then that and that just goes just opens up that thing of going like try stuff out see what you like see what works for you have a way of actually measuring whether you actually do feel better or not um and uh yeah, just wanted to sort of segue into, yeah, into yeah. that because that was you brought that up nice. I before. think they're all like that. I touched something with the compression as well. Like I like wearing compression garments. I've got a set on now because I've just I'm going to train in a bit, um, not massively because it's of any other reason that I feel like I'm massively need the recovery. But they're just comfortable to wear. And if if doing something like that makes you feel good, um, then then it's it's of benefit. There is value in that. And and that was a, the study that Jacko is referring to is around uh, one they did on, on with the Australian rules. Um, I was with football players and they tried a number of different combinations of, of ice baths and active mobility and static stretching and all these different compression. And what they couldn't find was any real correlation between them. I think it was, um, I think ice baths and um, static stretching actually came up pretty well, but the, not because they physiologically could imp- show why they and they haven't yeah. shown why, but the, what they were finding was athletes were feeling more prepared and better recovered for the game the following week. 
but they came down to the highlight of the, of the study was that it's probably about a great deal of perception. Yeah. If it feels good to get cold and you feel like you've done something, then it's probably going to have an impact. Yeah. And as you say, that's super size. Or it's, if you take your basics as like, if you sleep and everything's on, on point, and then we go and hit something else like uh, that makes us feel good. Then we're probably going to promote that recovery or that feeling of recovery. Um, and that, but I just will put that the caveat to that is I think that mental approach to a team sport is quite different to what we have to do in the gym. When you go in the gym and it's dark winter's night in the UK, how I feel about my training going into that and then what I'm actually able to do physically is a different environment to going out into a sports pitch where you've got the adrenaline of the game. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I d- uh, yeah, I know I would agree um, with that. There was just one, um, you made me think of um, one thing there where you're talking about, about that, the, the, that study that ultimately compared to those in the study that were doing nothing, doing something oh, yeah. was like the, the one thing that they could say was definitely helping improve it like that was the sort of the big takeaway of that that i you know i took away from it It was like well if you don't do anything doing something is better than nothing whether you Mm. whether that you've got the uh the science to explain why maybe it's a placebo it doesn't matter what actually the main important thing is that you recover better for the next session you're going to do and and going to stop you from overtraining yeah Yeah. so i think it's a nice for, for for people listening it's a nice simple i think sometimes takeaway messages are always not super simple mm. like depending on what the subject matter is but that you can't get that much simpler than that going yeah, yeah, yeah. if you do something it's going to be better than yeah. doing nothing well, i've got sort of four, well, a t-shirt. four key points <laughs> yeah that, something's better than nothing something's better than nothing <laughs> and more is more um I, i've got yes yeah, the four sort of key points to, to wrap this up so go right back to the beginning about thinking about um that, that context of overtraining is not something that we want to get to at all but you understand where the what we're trying to avoid is essentially where we've then gone with this so the, the roadmap back from that is yes you're going to train you're going to train hard how are you going to continue to allow yourself to train hard and progress by making better decisions and choices around um, your recovery strategies so the number one thing that i've got to start off with is listening to your body and to make sure that you are present and you're aware of how you're feeling and having the discipline and the confidence to be able to act based on that. Because if you just ignore it, you, if you're waking up, you don't really want to go to the gym, you're feeling niggly, but this addictive cycle of training is just eating away at you. And I've been there myself before. Um, it doesn't lead to a great place is yeah. what I'm going to say. So just yeah, listen to what, what your body is telling you. And, and most of us have got additional stresses, as Jacko said before. I wanted to show Jacko's I've also the camera. written that listen to your body down as well. And but the big di- the the big difference is you listen to your body well. I need to practice listening to my body. There's one thing uh writing it down or mm. saying this is what I'm gonna do. It's actually if you're not used to actually listening to your body, your body's trying to tell you loads of stuff, but if you're not actually spending any time listening to that, it's gonna be harder for you. It's not gonna happen all of a sudden. Yeah. So if you take that on board after listening to the podcast think about it like anything we need to practice that and you're gonna the more you do it you're gonna get better at listening to your body and then you're gonna really start don't sack it off if the first session you like and it's not like a telephone call to your body <laughs> don't don't sack it off if it like didn't change the world for you all these things are not there's we're not looking for magic pills we're looking for lots of little small things that over a longer period of time build up and have a have a major effect in the long term but not on the in the micro and the short term and that happens if people lose the mojo a little bit as well doesn't it? like all of a sudden just not feel like i want to do it so that's the first one the second one is just schedule recovery so make sure that if you are training hard that you have then got periods of time where you're going to give yourself a deload sometimes you can be flexible on that one but it ties in with point one of going if you're really sort of like consistent with your training and every single week, like an athlete, you're hitting set number of, pro or of sessions, it's five sessions a week at great intensity, nothing ever gets in the way of your training, you 100% need to have scheduled recovery times in. If like me, your training can be a bit up and down, whereas one or two weeks I'm going hard then all of a sudden I've got a lot of work to do or we're traveling or whatever it might be then I'm probably going to roll that deload or that scheduled recovery a little bit more flexibly. But that, the success of that relies on me being able to listen to my body. So I'll take a deload when I feel like I need a deload. But that's years of 
learning that process and being disciplined. So it could be to start off with that you have a scheduled deload four weeks after or, or five, six weeks into a block. If you get to that and you're sort of like feeling, do you know what? I actually feel great. Then fine. Do a little bit more that week. If you get to that point and you're like, do you know what? It would actually be quite nice for a down week. So I have a bit of a time off then take but make sure that it is on your agenda and it's not a negative. It's actually extreme positive to have those periods of rest off the back of high intensity blocks of training. Should we go from a three? Yep. Um, nail the basics. That is what I'm going to say about that, Jacko. We've probably hammered that home up at this point, but do the, do this, the, 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 take the, the, the low hanging fruit and the easy wins are your basics. Do those well first and then you can start to scale it from there. And then my last one is experiment with some of this other stuff. Um, if you, I've experimented before with a number of different things. Um, some of it, I think, we're still talking about recovery. Others, we're still talking <laughs> about recovery. Um, to play around with some different stuff, see if it works. Um, I don't come home and jump in a cold bath full of ice, partly because I just don't think it's going to have a massive benefit for what I'm doing. I also think that there's um, like the compression side of things and just sitting horizontally in the bath is not great. Time logistics of putting ice in the bath all that sort of stuff um not to say there isn't benefits of cold water therapy but it's just not something that works for me whereas you, yeah Dave, talk well about so was, salts. yeah well i wanted to to ask you what you do do but just before you answer that just on that like i got a relatively funny story on i i do like and during some of my best training periods is when i've been really disciplined with um having having cold baths um and I, I, I my body likes it i like how i feel afterwards and it, it seems like if it helps my recovery i'm happy if it's just a, a placebo um and though so i've and i'll go through periods where i hadn't been done it for 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 ages but um <laughs> i think it was last week or the week before i did it before bed and i was so cold i couldn't get warm <laughs> I was lying in bed. Temperatures down. I was lying in bed. So I then had a terrible night's sleep. I just couldn't get warm. Let your blanket was on, not touching the sides. Do you know the strategy on on sleep on that is actually a warm shower, shower followed by a fairly cool bedroom. So they reckon warm shower before bed, eighteen degrees in the bedroom that helps you get sleep. So you did it the wrong way around. Yeah. But yes, off that, I'm actually I, I like a cold shower. But anyway, different yeah. conversation maybe for me to get someone to talk about cold water at some point. Yeah. Good. But what? So what? You personally, what do you? What do you? You've, you mentioned your pressure, compression garments. Yeah, but that's almost because I like wearing them. Yeah. Um, I like to train in them because it just feels comfortable. So I don't use anything other than my level one. You basically. Yeah. Your, the thing is with Tim, like he's, he's very good at his basics, and it's a, you that would just take that on board if those yeah. that. Are, the compression was level two, but I'm using it not for the purposes necessarily of recovery. Yeah. Um, sometimes if I've got a compression garment on my, t- like if I've done a, if I'm feeling it upper body, I have got a tight upper body garment, which I sometimes sleep in yeah. if I'm hammered. But generally, yeah, it's just like, can I, my, my DLO is the thing that saved me. My, yeah. it's, it's my scheduled period of time where I'm just backing off. And I've come back from, and from nutrition. Yeah. I think give that its juice. You're good on that. And South Africa was like four weeks off training pretty much. I've come back and everything feels great. I don't feel that strong. I, I needed to do more, but that people, we get questions all the time about golfer's elbow or, or wrist pain. I'm like, what do I need to do? And I'm like, rest. Yeah. And the looks people give me, I'm like, the only way to get rid of a tendinopathy from, our, from that perspective, yeah, there's some corrective stuff you can do, but it needs to be deloaded rested, because yeah. you've, you've frayed that tendon so much that it now can't recover and it's going to need takes time. So you need to unload it. People don't want to hear that, but that's the point. Do that well first. We don't get to that point. If my elbows start niggling, I back them off and give them some rest and some recovery. It's, it's being sensible with that. Yeah. Yeah. And my last one, I'm going to get Jack to wrap it up because I just got a quote that I thought was really interesting from a, a track and field athlete, an American called Lauren Fleshman. It says, anyone can train hard, but do you have the discipline to recover? And I think that's the, uh, the real key point. It's the same as we've using conditioning before in the past. Anyone can make you tired. Anyone can make you sick. But can you actually... <laughs> yeah put together a properly structured training program, which is going to give you an adaptation. It's exactly the same. Recovery is a strategy. What strategy are you going to use to get the outcome that you want? And it takes discipline. Yeah. And it could be, it could be the thing that stops you getting injured. It could be the major difference in you progressing and, and achieving the goals that you want to do. It is, it is, it could, it's not a magic bullet in the, in like the short term, but it is over the longer period potentially going to make the difference for you yeah and i think in today's world those number one level basics are, are more important than they've probably ever been before yeah. because we're dealing with so much stress and stimulation all day every day 
that just those are goes back to Sally Bell. Like it's if you go back to it, we're talking recovery, same principles about health and well being carries through. It's I don't think there's any coincidence that the body responds well to these things if they're done well. And what we can then put on is a little bit of icing if yeah. you want to go and play around with tomorrow. Yeah, uh, Sally Bell, that's Dr. Sally Bell. Uh, we did a two part series with her functional medicine practitioner and doctor. So if you haven't seen those and you are interested in in that, they are, I've listened to them back myself as well because they're, they are, there's some gold in there. They're really good ones. So I do, do check them out. I can't remember the numbers off the top of my head. I did mention actually, the, the very briefly, something to finish on is your, you've got experience. Ep- you ex- yeah, so I was going to say, I was going to, I was going to answer the question. What did you do, Jacko? Oh, um, sorry, yeah. rewind. It's a, Jack, tell us about your recovery strategies. Basically the same. Basically, <laughs> basically, basically the same as yours. Um, Try to take care of those. There were ones he said, I've got a tight compression top that, again, like you said, sleep in sometimes, but just not every night by far. Um, and then, yeah, as I said, talk, we talked about cold. And then the other um, bathing therapy that I like is um, Epsom salts. So there's, um, which is basically magnesium. Ma- yeah, magnesium sulfate. And what you try and do is get a, uh, you know, the, the magnesium is dissolved into the water and it's going to come in through uh, the skin and, and come into the body um, that way. And there's, there's plenty of research out there. You can have a little bit of a look yourself. There's one from uh, the University of Birmingham, Dr. Waring, um, that's looked at this a few times. And, um, because there's some questions about like how much actually goes through yeah. into how it actually comes in through the skin, et cetera. But there's, 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 so, there's evidence out there. Um, and maybe in even for me, maybe it's a placebo, maybe it isn't, but with same, same principle as with the cold, uh, but there is some research out there to say that in, um, in an athletic population, if you're training hard, that magnesium levels do deplete because of how they get used for, for your energy production, for your training. And, um, and the Epsom salts can be, a good way to do that and the sort of general markers are about 400 to 600 grams in a average size bath depending on how much of a how big your bath is then you're gonna have to work <laughs> off of that but that's basically like a decent cups work cup full of um epsom salts it's quite if you've never tried it it's um it's quite an easy one a hot bath um nice and relaxing and etc as well and um, I said, but it aside be, it's from pretty the, cheap like. aside from the fact of actually whether the epsom salt do anything or not what i think is probably quite good for you is to sit in a bath yeah. put some candles on read your book yeah and then get your gaffer tape out <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> ready for bed <laughs> everyone's giving me a lot of questions about the gaffer tape just <laughs> really too. but you've well, got a good tip though epsom salt is much cheaper off somewhere like ebay than getting them yeah. from boots yeah, yeah i go like sorry you roots. can you can well, you can go boots and just get like a small, you can get like your 400 grams for like test out one thing and it'll cost you like a couple of quid or something. Fine. You get half a ton for your local <laughs> yeah. <those> merch. <laughs> yeah. You can go, uh, I get mine off eBay or Amazon or whatever. And you're like, if, if you buy a 25 or 20 kilo bag, you get it like a pound a kilo. So it's like, it's pence per, um, per bath. And there, yeah, that's if you're well into it, then you can go bulk. Um, but yeah, other than that, I think that's um, cool some ground pretty, today, much a, pretty much a wrap. Yeah, enjoyed it. Cool with some ground. I hope uh, hope you out there listening, um, listening, or hopefully this will go out on, uh, you might be watching on YouTube as well. Thank you to those that logged in, the VIP members of the virtual classroom to listen to it live. Um, you're hearing it literally as we're talking. Um, for everyone else, it's, well, you're listening to it now, but Coming it's two soon. weeks after you. Yes. It's one of those things like when you're listening to it, you you know what I mean? It's like live for everyone, but it's not. I know what you mean. Like when they're, as I'm saying this now, they're listening, they're here. If you're listening on iTunes, it is the day that you're listening to it. On. <laughs> but we recorded it on a different day, do you know what I mean? Like we're the future. Yeah. Or no, we're the past. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Complex problems. I don't know if anyone else yeah, does. Sure. Like, it's a good job you never studied quantum mechanics or something <laughs> like that, wasn't it? You're doing all right, mess. Anyway, that is it. That is it. Um, it up. If you've got any questions, guys, you can engage with us on social. Send them over on um, on Instagram or, or whichever platform you prefer. Um, if you've enjoyed the podcast and you think it will be useful for the people, then please share it around. Yeah. We really value um, any support that you want to give in just spreading the word about some of this information that we're trying to disseminate. Yes, share it around with, 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 with friends. We'd really um, appreciate that. Um, check out some of those other podcasts that we mentioned as well, the sleep, the, the ones with Dr. Um, 
and give us a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to the podcast. We really appreciate that. We really like as it well. as well when you take a screenshot and you post it. Yes, screenshot. Well, what I'd, I'd be interested in hearing what recovery strategies other people yes. do. There might be some things that we've not mentioned. Um, you know, screenshot the podcast, put on, let us a little note of like, what things do you do? Uh, and then, then we'll share those so we can start to, within that whole community um, online, we can start to share everybody. So everyone is going to be able to hear. Um, Tim's laughing at me now for some reason. Everyone's going to be able to, you know, share what recovery things they have. And that might, throw a few other extra things into the mix but i was just going to say if anyone's got any good gaffer tape tips that send those in dm i wouldn't put them public <laughs> i'll send you a photo oh yeah <laughs> just, right. yeah anyway let's get off that round let's, yeah, let's, let's go 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 so uh, thanks for listening guys we massively appreciate it i hope you guys have a good week get on get stuck into your training and until next time class dismissed oh.